Hello once again everyone and welcome to Snowbound Blood. We've finally come to the point that I've been excited for over the past couple of days. Volume 5 Part 2 because we get to see Mashiri and apparently I asked Badger like uh, on a scale of uh, 1 to 10 how tender is this and Badger said 11 so I am Oh, I'm looking forward. <laughs> uh, apparently, like, also Badger said, like, I'd want to have Mashiri's roots after Arceus's to, like, help me settle down from the uh, stuff that went on in Arceus's route. Ooh! -hoo -hoo! Ooh! Ooh! -hoo -hoo -hoo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm excited! Um, she's been on your mind for a while, and not just because of your recently acquired bumps and bruises. It's time you paid Mashiri a better call, for business and for pleasure. <laughs> so here you are, making your way through the Stronghold Zone Pale Light District, an area dedicated to the night's less colourful, but not necessarily less lib libidinous delights. You turn left onto the Pastel Promenade, heading for an apartment building l l lim Limbed with fluorescent pink about half a block away, the la lapels, lapels of your long coat are pulled up against the cold and prying eyes. Even though the district is corporate sanctioned, as all internal districts are, there's still a like um, there's still a like unshakable need for surreptitiousness that grips most people whenever they whenever they come here. Because while there's no shame in availing oneself of temp services, either corporate, state-sponsored, or free commercial, there's something phys um, psych f psychically degrading about the ins and outs of withdrawal management. That's all stuff you're used to by now, though. Your caution is for other reasons. By now you've hopped the steps of the co-op um, temp apartment building and spiked Mashiri's buzzer with one weary finger. She knew you were coming, but not what state you'd arrive in. You're not all that forthcoming about personal injury on your best of days, and certainly not when you're at all nervous about phone security. Here she is. The carpet-muted shuffling sounds of someone about to open a door gently tug you out of a characteristic overthink, and then suddenly Mashiri is here. Here she is! You're sure th <coughs> you make quite the display. Exhausted, coat ragged, silly band-aid still on your head as a kind of ironic ornament. <laughs> oh, so we had that fucking band-aid ever since we left Orica. <coughs> no offence meant to the on-scene first aid you received, but it felt necessary to have someone back at the office give you an actual once-over after the whole ordeal. It's definitely not the worst shape you've darkened Mashiri's doorstep in. But despite the rest, it's close. Oh my goodness, Lily! Oh, that's so cute! Oh, my God, that's like a um. Apparently, that's like a nickname she has for us. Her eyes widen in surprise. There's a pinch to her eyebrows, and despite the less than ideal circumstances of this particular meeting, you can't help but admire her for a few seconds. Ooh, so gay! You feel a smile tug at your lips. Hey, Mashiri. Oh, she's not even using her quirk. Like, she's not battling against Mashiri here. She, like, feels as if she can stop, you know, playing her games. She can let go. The moment is immediately ruined by a ragged, wet cough that claws its way out of your lungs. Mashiri goes out of focus for a few brief seconds and your head spins. When you manage to adjust your eyes again, she's standing right in front of you, doing her best to hold you upright by the shoulders. Oh, oh, mother, you're hurt. Yeah, we just fainted about how um, out of how gay we are. <laughs> Sit down. I'm fine, I'm fine. Don't worry. I just hit my head a bit. It's been a rough few days. To put it mildly. She purses her lips in a manner that is equal fats pon... Pa fats pon... Cut parts fond and exasperated. It's a look you've become intimately acquainted with over the sweeps. <laughs> you know, dear thing. Oh, tender. 
Do you take me for a fool? She's already leading you inside before you can object, one arm wrapped around your waist in order to support your weight. You're not sure you can even want to you even want to protest at this point, to be entirely honest. Oh, it looks so nice in here. It's been a rough few days, and you're one concussion over your recommended daily limit of blunt trauma to the think pan. Letting someone with experience take care of you will hardly make things worse. Ooh. You half stumble, half follow Mishiri through her living room. It's a practiced motion. You know this place by heart. All the meticulously organized personal belongings, every carefully arranged piece of furniture. She lets you down on her couch with a grunt, and you let yourself fall gracelessly against the soft cushions. Oh, mother, you're tired. Your head feels so heavy. Well, that's a nice harp she's got there. You allow yourself a few seconds of respite as Mashiri moves away from you. Her eyes close and you lean your head back against the back of the couch, idly listening to the soft rustling as she flits about the room. A few minutes later, you feel the press of something cold against the side of your head. You crack one eye open and find Mashiri leaning down in front of you, inspecting your wounds. She tusks in disapproval, then gently runs a hand through your hair and tucks it behind your left ear. That's... Ooh, that's tender! This bandage is woefully insufficient. What kind of slipshod medical attention you did, did you mis... I cannot speak. Did you receive? A raspy chuckle leaves you at her words. You le lean her, your head against her free hand as she cups your cheek. Ooh, gay! My old friend Norica has found a new hobby in first aid. You'll find I'm carrying a great deal of evidence of her handiwork and a new piece of gear by way of apology. Your answer seems to catch her off guard. She blinks rapidly, mouth hanging open at a confused O. Oh. Wait, Orica did this to you? Well, not really. She was appalled at a game I seem to understand less and less of every day. There's an antagonistic force out there, an insidious messenger driving trolls to their deaths. I'm ashamed to admit I almost fell right into his trap. The admission comes with some difficulty, almost like a confession. You don't meet her eyes as the words leave your mouth. There's a pause in the conversation. Then she moves the cold compress away from your head, setting it down on a nearby table. The sudden change in temperature leaves a warm, tingly imprint on your skull. Mishiri wordlessly helps you shrug off your coat, hands gentle. She's also so, always so careful with you when she deems it necessary, as if you're made of fine glass. Ooh, tender! You'd find the comparison humorous if you weren't feeling so brittle. She sits herself next to you, placing a hand against your jaw and forcing you to turn your head until the two of you are face to face to get face to face again. Ooh, I can't speak. This is so gay. Oh, tenderness. You need to take it more slowly. I haven't seen you since this business began. I've heard a great deal about this case already. But I don't think anyone truly knows just how much you're taking on. You let out a puff of air, wrapping your hand around her own. Ooh! I prefer to work in the background, you know that. There's working in the background and then there's suffering alone. You're trying to solve a conspiracy as a one woman agency. You need a team, Lily. Inside, inside assistance was necessary for this heist, how can I know who to trust? Her eyes flash with a familiar intensity before she replies, a sign which you know means that the gears have started turning inside her head. It's been a while since you've collaborated on a case together. The thought is like a bolt of electricity running through you. Start from the other side. What are the problems you're facing? And who can help solve them? Uh. Hacking. It's clear that our opponent... Mashiri smirks a bit. Our. Shh, you said I should have a team. You've been drafted. Always happy to help. Your face runs a bit hot. Not now, Shiri, you tried to do tactics. As I was saying, our opponent is quite deft with computers. And the other trolls Orica told me he messaged. Many of them are dead. Ruled suicides, but I think a few juniors review those cases. I'm self-aware enough to know that I can't handle that avenue on my own. But it's likely he's either high up inside corp corporate infosec or has comprised, compromised someone within. Hmm... I know of quite the proficient programmer. Through some rampant speculation about his unusual personal relationships amongst the mediators. 
Wait, is this one of the vaunted boys I've been hearing so much about? One and the same. You had an odd feeling about Bitcoin and Indari's descriptions of their tight-knit social circle. Was it revulsion or envy? Perhaps I'll reach out. Uh, insider knowledge. I could navigate the typical corporate bureaucracy while we root around for a mole. I have a board mandate for information gathering without anyone asking too many questions. It may be worth getting more help from the heir and his liaison as well. I've been trying to avoid putting them in harm's way. Her gaze softens at your words. She strokes your cheek with her thumb. Ooh! Soft. Gay. Fair. I'll consider other options. Combat support. If this is indeed a conspiracy, it might be useful to have more muscle by my side. And I imagine none of the junior regulators meet your rigorous standards. Pencil pushers, a lot of them. Nobody does proper field work anymore. They have the drones do it. Maybe Orica's mate spirit would do. Worth an exploration, at least. That is, if you'll survive another encounter with Rust. Weaponry. Why are my dogs barking? I'm trying to be tender and gay here. Proserpina and my snub-nosed revolver serve me well, but I want, might want something a bit longer range for dealing with a well-prepared enemy. It would be worth your time to look into weapon stealers anyway. See if there have been any suspicious purchases. Quite. Hopefully I can find something not too gaudy to wield. For someone who wears the same thing every day, you are quite concerned with the aesthetics of your arsenal. It's not a crime to take pride in the tools of your trade. Mashiri gives you a knowing look at this remark. Of course. Cultist contacts. The diary was a bust as far as occult knowledge goes. It just doesn't befit a vivifier sect like the Mora to leave bodies behind and work with a serial murdering nihilist. I need some other way in. Hmm. Nothing comes to mind immediately. But I'll look through the files I have. I'm glad you're accepting help. Ridiculous as this figure may be, the threat he represents must be taken seriously. He tried to sweep the queen off the board in the opening. I worry you'll accept the sacrificial gambit one day, Lily. So what does he want? Besides you out of his way. Not profit. Left it in his wake throughout this whole ordeal. Valuables in the truck, sea dweller wealth untouched. No sign of this thing popping up on the black market. I thought you'd lost your black market contact blinks ago. Found a new one. Siraj Feltry. Had her pegged as a suspect and ended up drunk in her office instead. Of course. You really do have a problem, Lily. What, with drinking? No. With women. Says the biggest part of it. You come to my door for a sucker and then slander my good name. What a diplomat. It's not slander if it's true, Mediator. Those are fighting words, Chief Regulator. Ooh! Ooh! Square up. <laughs> what? You heard me? <laughs> you raise your fist in a faux defensive posture as she does indeed square up. You idly swat away a few fake jabs and, and history's gentlest left hook. Mashiri laughs and leans in, punching the fists, pushing the fists of your boxer's stance apart to get close. Ooh! 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 We're about to we're about to see some lip. Mashiri spelt um swells of spring air like none of the smog of the world outside has ever touched her. You, her lily, close your eyes and embrace her, pressing her lips to Mashiri's forehead gently. Ooh! You know, I think I showed great pugilistic promise there. I think I'd have solid odds if we thought fall for real. If we fought for real, yeah, you'd win. A delicate warmth has been oozing slowly and inevitably through the room, like a very viscous, very affectionate, lukewarm lava flow, while the two of you have been chatting. Mishiri Labetta is one of those rare, faintly haloed if you squint people that you sometimes get up in the morning and thank the old mother for the grace of having met, metaphorically speaking. Ooh, that's so cute! It's really thanks to her, Mashiri Labetta, five foot two, give or take in her flat soled shoes, hair sleek and meticulously kept, presence vaguely cinnamon infused, that you're alive in the first place. It's all beginning to take you back. Recall after Alina. Oh. 
They told me you'd be coming. Armed um, guards at the door didn't give you any trouble, I hope. Can I take your coat? Why? You're still wearing yours. Do you require a second? No. To... well... hmm... A little joke can go a long way towards diffusing the tension in situations like these. If you are cold though, I can assist in warming you up. Ooh! I could make a spot of tea. Oh. I prefer my liquids without grit as a rule. I'm fine. Right. Very well then. Well, I'm certain an official in your administrative capacity is well aware of my role and the purpose thereof. Regulations still require me to provide a basic introduction. My name is Mashiri Libetta. I am a temporary emotional mediation partner. You could just say temp like everyone else, much more efficient. I am trained to assist in the stabilisation of corporate assets in the event of the loss of a bondmate, should a registered moirail not be available. And I have been licensed in the practice for over a sweep. Just a sweep? Was everyone more senior to afraid after my outburst? I know I gave Zayim quite the bruise. While it is possible that some of my cohorts may have considered your reputation in conjunction with the recent incident a challenge to take on, I assure you I am not at all frightened of you, and hope to be of assistance in this difficult time. Let us go over your medical history. Let's not. As you wish. We can handle the paperwork later. I doubt it. I appreciate your offer, but I'm fine. Well, I'm sure you're appropriately qualified. I'm declining temp services, as is my right person to Article 5. I'll return to work after the mandatory leave period assigned to me. Don't play games with me, Cecily. You're up against the wall right now. Everything that matters to you is under siege. You're barely hanging on. I've read your file. You assaulted a superior officer. If you send me back, they're not going to send another temp. They're going to send the chief regulator. So play nice for a minute so I can at least get the armed guards off your stoop. Capiche? While Article 5 of the bylaws does give the worker consumer the right to decline mediation services, it does still require the completion of a standard evaluation report, and declining that report with a resource readiness inqui inquiry pending will trigger a review by the Chief Regulator. Apologies, let's continue. Have your prescribed medications changed? There are a number here. I've been taking the same ones for a couple sweeps. Can I ask you a question? Of course. When does it start? A hand upon yours. Comforting. Woo! Okay. Well, it depends on where you were on your cycle, of course. Where, where you were at on your cycle, of course. And when was the last time you reaffirmed your bond? It was the first thing you noticed when she appeared at your door that day, and something you haven't stopped noticing in the sweep since. How much she looks like Alina. Her looking like that and asking that question seared in your gut indescribably. But now in the present, the pain has become something else. Less of a burn and more of a dull, pale ache. I hope I'm not causing you too much trouble. You've been causing trouble for me for ten sweeps. Don't stop now, Lily. Just make it good trouble. I have done a lot more thinking about what good is. I learned more about corporate. I've seen things. I know, the level of responsibility. It's always going to be impossible to do everything right. And we're up against much worse. Are we really? This guy. The voice in your ear. Where does he prey on people? Hassle them. Turn their friends against them. Where does he find the members of the mobs he sends after his targets? You know this. On the internet. If a bomb is delivered via post, do you call the parcel troll an accomplice? Parcel trolls didn't put a system in every troll's pocket. At great expense, mind you. It algorithmically decides what to show you, controls how you get information, connects you instantly to thousands. 
Corporate did. Corporate centralised our systems of social interaction. They created a pipeline that encouraged, encourages trolls to document everything about themselves for public consumption. A spotlight that leads dangerous people right to the people they threaten. Your fancy new visor accesses corporate records to get the information you need to kill people. This figure uses corporate records. In this case, social media run on their servers and maintained by their engineers to find information on who he kills. Don't compare me to... I'm not, Lily. I've never. You have accountability. You file each piece of information gathered. You report to supervisors. You were evaluated for this power. Trained for it and were judged worthy to wield it. Shouldn't that same accountability be a applicable to both the system you operate in and the system he does? It's always about the next big evil bad guy with you. But bad guys don't exist in a vacuum. If they did, they'd quickly suffocate, which would obviate the need for this whole conversation. Bad people... <coughs> bad people are created by systems and enabled by systems. And the systems that make them and sustain them should be looked into a little deeper. That's all. You always manage to make the radicals sound so mundane. You're dangerous with theory. I'm dangerous all the time. Yeah, me too. You pause and take in the dimming light outside. It's always like this with her. Hours passing in what seems like the blink of an eye. Conversations spanning every aspect of your lives, all tangled up in each other. No, you're wrong. It's not always like this. There have been times where the two of you have tried to untangle yourselves, for her sake. The first try was almost ten sweeps ago. The last wasn't long ago at all. Meditation <coughs> is an ancient tradition. Its practitioners are tight-knit and like any high society, they gossip. As the sweeps of Mashiri's work stretched on, her colleagues began to talk talk about her behind her back as an oddity, never dipping into red or black relationships, focusing wholly on her profession and you. One evening she'd been quite upset. <coughs> a bottle of wine and a session later you discovered it was because they dubbed you Cecily your parasite. You thought it was sweet that she'd get so upset over a slight to you, the nickname didn't bother you much, but seeing her back here after another final separation and her falling red for another brings it back to mind. Shiri's mediator peers are to a one socially perceptive. You watch her glide around the room, the picture of serenity, a blessing you never understood. She's circling around, putting sputtering matches to the wicks of many candles to light the dimming room, flames dancing in her dark eyes. She's one of the few practitioners of the old ways, with new hires opting out of monasterial isolation and intensive study it requires. Most are elderly now. She unties the ribbon from her hair, which lets you see the gold-threaded inscription embroidered on it. It's in the old tongue. Most trolls, including you, get your education through technology. Dead languages weren't on the curriculum. Mashiri, though, grew up studying intensively with others in her tradition, and can speak and write fluently in pretext. She's tried to explain it to you, but somewhere around declension, you always start losing focus. Her dark hair spills down her back as she sits down beside her harp and begins to move her soft fingers delicately across the strings. Again a creature of uncommon talent, she knows well your difficulty with most music, but the slow, wandering tones she plays always put you at ease. You walk up to her slowly and kneel beside her on the soft matte floor. You watch and breathe and wait for her to begin the next part of her ritual. She sings a slow, mournful song in the old tongue, syllables softly flowing. You close your eyes and let the sound wash over you. You think the effect would be spoiled if you understood the words. Oh, she's singing to us! As it is, you can imagine it's exactly what you need to hear. A decoration of feelings and understanding, in words so plain and clear as to make every stopped up river inside your head flow freely again. You lose track of time, a rare privilege for you. And as she continues to play, you close your eyes as the last notes fade into a resonant memory. You hear the shifting fabric as she shifts across the mat, from beside her harp to your side. She lifts up your hands and lays them on one knee. You open your eyes. Shiri is looping her gold threaded hair ribbon under your wrists. A prayer is woven into it. She reads that prayer quietly, melodically, as the thread touches your skin. 
As she loops the ribbon around itself in an elegant knot, binding her wrists together, you remember what it means from the translation she first provided for you eight sweeps ago. Well, we're tying our wrists together, are we going a bit? Hmm. <clears throat> o oh, mother of omniscient name, impart a gift unto this plane. Deliver peace and respite now upon this well-deserving brow. The ribbon, in concert with her words and touch, feels attached to something greater, like you were tethered to a great enveloping root that winds its way through the soil of all that ever was. As if in action we do err, gather us then into your care, and our step, and make us wise, so we may be your thousand eyes. When the ribbon is pulled taut, binding your wrists, she pulls back, happy with her handiwork. You, like always, catch yourself before you lean longingly after her. A wistful questioning look flickers across her face in the candlelight. What does it mean to want to make someone happy? I've asked myself this question a great deal. Over our sweeps together. I want to make you happy. I know this much is true. You've seen me at my worst. I fear I might not be far from it now. People are dying and I can't even see the shape of the problem. I've been poring over every suicide on recent record, looking for connections. I don't have time to be happy, not while this monster is out there. Right now while we're talking, someone's seeing words on a screen that'll push them closer to giving up. There's a selfish way to be selfless, you know. Where you make the problems of your world your problems. And let the pain rain down on you. And burn as the rain burns. It feels productive to hurt. <coughs> She tightens the bonds on your wrist, not enough to pinch, but just enough for the soft ribbon to constrict, cut off circulation and squeeze firmly. But pain for pain's sake accomplishes nothing. Your agony cannot revive the dead of the past, nor can your guilt prevent the dead of the future. Happiness works kind of like magnetism. It's a force that comes about through alignment. Like how a magnet is created by aligning the atoms in a bar of iron. Happiness is a construction that requires people's desires to be aligned in a corresponding way. Along certain shared axes. Usually neurotypical ones, mind you. Trolls who throw off the alignment or whose desires point in different directions. These people are seen as disrupting the rights to happiness of everyone else. You saying my natural inclination towards unhappiness is a harm to society? Is that why you're so fascinated with fixing me? I can't fix you. Nor do I want to. A long time ago it was my job to. And for some time after that I admit I entertained the fancy that there was a conventional life possible for you. That I could find the right combination of words and the right soothing touch to make it a reality. The tips of her knuckles brush across your cheek. You weren't expecting it. Your senses dulled and eyes shut and it gives you a sudden chill. She lingers, <coughs> dragging her hand agonisingly slowly until the tips of her fingers brush your chapped bottom lip. You fight the bizarre urge to bite. This is gay. I thought I could fill whatever gulf lies within you. You could live a normal life. The weight of this world off of you. I wanted to take you away from here, Lily. But there's nowhere else. And that made me realise how selfish that desire was. She's gotten closer now. You can feel her breath on your face. Does she know how this feels for you? She must. This dance you've been dancing for sweeps. You don't know why she does this to you. How she actually feels. You've never bonded. Can't ever bond. You made sure of that when you met Yeshin seven sweeps ago. In these moments though, your thought thoughts swim with frustration and love. In another life, could it have been different? Would she have wanted that? Duty and selfishness, obligation and personal desire, together and then not. The two of you, irrevocably intertwined, what is the line of pale? This world needs you. It asks you to be a machine, but flesh wears and weakens where metal does not. The mind rends with the dissonance of purpose. Someone must put you back together. You're kneeling on her soft tatami mat, hands and ankles bound, soft sound of harmonic wind chimes outside. Your vision swims with deeper shades of black behind closed eyes. Her hand, dull clawed but nimble, brushes the short, short buzzed hair on the side of your head and gently guides you closer. Ooh, ooh. She kisses you. It's gentle, full of feeling, and gives you the sensation of falling. It always does. You never ask her for this. You never have. 
But you all, <laughs> but you always end up coming back to each other. And you kiss back hungrily. Ooh, this is gay. This is. I thought that forehead kiss was like, because Badger told me that they kiss in the root. And ho ho, I thought that forehead kiss was it. But ho 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 ho. Ooh. You want her all to yourself and she wants to keep you. Unthinkable for a mediator and at the same time so simple. The radical made mundane. If you had an ounce of shame you'd catch fire with it. If you were concerned with appearances about the foundation of taboo your arrangements is built on then both you and it would burn to the ground. But you don't ignite. There are no observers here. No shame. In this moment there is no repertoire to save. No murder to solve. No strict limits to adhere to. Just your lips and hers, and her hands roaming across your skin, warm and soothing. Ooh! Checks to see my mother isn't listening. So, I have something to tell you while you're here. It's difficult. Previously, when assigned a client, we'd be given a folder, printed out information. Their history is past our eyes, etc. You'd been pushing Sestro to rectify that, right? Yes. And he did. Thanks to the for the assist on that one. So there's a new computer system that lets us search employee records. I know I struggle with computers occasionally, but you don't have to warn me that you're about to talk about them. Hush. So I looked into a few things from the past. They digitised historical case files going back sweeps. As it happens, the one who used to provide me reports eventually transitioned to managing the OCR system. Oh, I liked him. Tinny? He helped me out back when I was junior three. The very same one. And yes, he's um, preserving entire libraries now. Worth the cost of your morning reading being nerfed, I'd say. I have this archivist do it for me now. Clever thing, but too enthusiastic by half. One time I asked her if an alibi of a guy buying chips at the time of the infraction was true. She gave me a ten page report that included a graph of quarterly profits in the convenience store industry indexed to power cost increases from crypto mining. Don't fuss. That report got you on Bitcoin's tail. Not that it's paid dividends, greasy bastard covers his rat tracks. At least his lead was interesting. You're getting distracted. You always change the subject when you fear bad news. You'll find I'm an expert at receiving bad news. Of course. It's a skill you've honed well. Uh, let's store more. Well, when it comes to owning myself, I'm sure you know all about that. You go for a smile that you hope is somewhat winning. Shiri chuckles a little politely. There's no heart in it, though. Cecily. Please. This doesn't look good. Your attempt at questionably platonic flirtatious prevarication hasn't made you feel any better about what's coming. Might as well get it over with. Oh no! No, is she going to break up with us? What is it? No point in delaying the unpleasant. At least it isn't taking you completely by surprise this time. Please! No, please don't be breaking up. Look, I... Search the Robiad file. Oh. See if there have been any updates on trolls of interest in her case. And I was surprised to find an unredacted copy on the database. Just hearing Alina's surname freezes you stock still. The posthumous file you received was pitifully thin. It was Mashiri herself who told you not to press, who emphasised acceptance. Something must be very off for her to bring it up now. You storm into Sestra's office, mind clouded with anger. You're surprised to see Hamifi sitting at his desk instead, caught off guard by her unannounced entry. What's going on? Where is he? She gives you a significant look. Oh, mother damn it, not now. Is he alright? He worried himself sick when your signal went dead a few days ago. It's been a challenging few wises and things haven't let up since the first bodies were found. We're getting strange reports. Nothing worth taking you off this case for yet. But it was all weighing on him a great deal. You know him. If anyone's hurting, he's hurting. He's been having an episode. He's one of corporate's closest guarded secrets. Ahem. <clears throat> While he's capable of intense focus, working tirelessly for days at a time, Sestro is prone to burning out in spectacular fashion. 
For up to a wife at a time, Hamifi had to take the heir's place where he can barely leave his coop. Some of your rage has already burned off as you remember the times you had to feed him. Now she handles that along with cleaning up his mess. The public doesn't know what she does. Perhaps it's for the best. You adopt a gentler tone. Take me to him. You're walking and talking now, passing through a hallway, both with nearly the sta same long loping stride. Vitals. All within acceptable bounds. White blood cell count good, blood pressure a little high, but it is, but it is as you know, not abnormal for him. Doesn't have our gift for it. How long has it been? Any lucid periods? You get in an elevator. Hamifi presses a touch stump to the print de um, detector and pushes the button for the penthouse bedroom. In about hour 14 he had a few spells of lucidity. We put a set together, we ate dinner, and I got him in the recuperacoom and he slept just fine. You didn't think to call me? Hamifi shoots you an annoyed look as she holds open the elevator door to Sestra's respite block, one that communicates, I can handle this, Monsieur Para. You hope she can. She switches to a whisper, and you can see why. The air is wrapped up in a blanket and slouched forward, sitting on that storage cube chair thing you've never liked. I didn't think it necessary to interrupt your rest yet. You could have died out there. Hamifi has moved behind Sestra and puts a hand on his only slightly responsive shoulder while you continue your hushed conversation. You whisper back. Glad to hear life is a new priority of the company. She looks taken aback. What? Do you know what happened to Alina Robiad? She was kidnapped. Yes, by a group of smugglers known to have only five members. Hamifi pauses. She whispers back. You've seen the full report then. I. Yes, they are a band of bootleggers. They sold low quality honey and sweetness as part of their racket. Alina's superior apiary techniques were making better goods for cheaper, running them out of business. So they turned to crime. They demanded a ransom. It's corporate policy to avoid paying large sums of money to criminals. I was physically restrained from intervening, and this company that I've given everything to, they negotiated? The executive negotiated the price on El my mate Spritz's life. He stayed my sword hand so he could ask them to knock off 30% like he was haggling for a shipment of concrete. Are you defending him? You can't believe you managed to keep whispering. You're barely keeping it together right now. Tears fall up at the corners of your eyes. The finger you gesture with shakes. Hamifi has her guard up. You hate that. I didn't expect this kind of anger from you. You've never been sentimental. You taught me how not to be. At that, you restrain yourself. This wasn't her fault. She wasn't even hatched the time Alina was killed. Your tone softens. I could have been sentimental. I was, for her. I taught you not to be? You're always so gentle with him. You picked up all the slack. It was clear I'd have to as well. Even now, this important thing. You wanted to go to him. Do you trust me? She's looking at Sestro, who lays there glassy-eyed beneath a blanket adorned with stars, hand on his shoulder. She looks closer to tears than you've seen her and sweeps. You told me not to trust anyone. But I do, Hermifi. She meets your gaze and the corner of her mouth twitches, just a little. You were never very good at following orders. Aw, oh, sleepy lad. He snooze. Damn, though. The... Hmm. The, uh, you know, the segueing from they kiss each other to the next day. Did they fuck? Hmm. I bet they didn't. Hmm. <clears> hmm. <throat> anyway, that was tender and gay. And... <laughs> Woo. Well... I guess that'll be it until next time. The goodbye, the end. <laughs>